Hey, good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dolph Simons Family Studio and delighted to be with you here today. On my right, of course, is Hawkeye. Hawkeye, what are the numbers like Hi. this morning? Uh, they're holding steady, unfortunately. Not going down, but luckily not going up either. We have 29 patients in the hospital uh, with active infection, but a third of those, 11 are in the ICU and seven of those are on the ventilator. We still have 33 patients in-house who would not be here who are in that recovery stage. So it's really, you know, more than 60 beds, more than 60 patients. Um, over in Hayes, they do have uh, 15 patients, 14 are active infection, and one is in that recovery period as well. So, Yeah, those are, those are big numbers still. And I think the concern, one of the, one of the other concerning things about COVID is if you look back a week ago um, on the Kansas City area rolling seven day average, um, it is it was uh, 450 cases yesterday. Um, one week ago, it was about 300 cases for that's that rolling big, seven day yeah. average. And we know that that's going to eventually translate into hospitals. Yep. It just takes two to three weeks for that to yeah. occur as that moves out. And, Absolutely. and unfortunately, the curve is not flattening. No. Yeah, that's a problem. Going the wrong direction. Hey, we're also joined this morning on my left by Dr. Becky Lowry, who's an outstanding internal medicine physician here at KU. I've known Becky since she was like wee tall because she did her, her medical school and her residency training, her chief residency here at KU. An outstanding physician. She's worked really hard with us on um, physician and provider wellness. So that's going to be kind of a topic about uh, that we want to address this morning. We also have uh, Ravi Sabapathy, who is a, uh, a psychiatrist or psychologist over at Advent Health. And, and together, they're going to help us us get through this conversation a little bit about what's going on with frontline healthcare workers, what's going on with providers, and, and how are we going to handle that as the COVID pandemic continues. So first, let's see if there are questions from media today. Good morning, guys. It's Taylor at Channel 41. How are you this morning? Good. Good. How are you, Good morning. Good, thank you. Uh, just wanted to, to get an update on the the touch part of, of this as far as um, communicating the virus or, or being contagious. Obviously, a lot of people heading out to vote. Uh, just wanted to see what it's like right now, what your recommendations are for people touching things like different parts of the ballot and, and that other people are going to be touching. How important is it still uh, or how cautious should people be with touching things they don't know if they've been wiped out or not? You bet. That's a great question, Taylor. Thanks for asking again, because we've, we're going to have a topic coming up in the next few weeks addressing this very exact question, because we want people to get out and vote. Yes. Hawk, um, you and I have both done some absentee yeah. balloting. I did mine at Union Station about two weeks ago, and uh, I have to say, it was really good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, went down, and I was very happy that people were really well distanced. Everybody had a mask on. They were very cautious about how you handled surfaces. You got the ballot. You went in. You did the thing, and you or you you, you got it. They, they put you up onto the touch screen, and then they the ballot printed off, and you went over and you stuck it in yourself into the voting machine. So I, I got to tell you, I think that they did a outstanding job. I felt safe the entire time, and um, I wish every event was as well organized. It would make you feel as safe as that did. So I think, I think process-wise, that was great, yeah. uh, and, and hopefully that continues. Second, but the second part of your comment is, how important are services? I think clearly it's the breath cloud more than anything that's spreading the virus. It can happen with a service, but I think, Dana, mm -hmm. we're looking less and less yeah. uh, like that's the mm -hmm. key. It's really all about the breath cloud. So I feel very safe voting. Yeah, I do too. I would certainly be more uh, concerned about just being in the line. So the line that I went to, I was down on, on Lamar in Johnson County. Um, I thought it was a very good process, very good system. Uh, I did have to wait in line and it was indoors for about 30, 35 minutes. It did move, but I think it was very good overall. Everybody was in a mask. I did see two people who just had a face shield only and they really did try to space as much as possible. So I think you can be safe doing that. Um, if you really have concerns about touching the surfaces, such as the voting uh, areas, but even then we were given um, disposable pens to have to use as our stylus for, for the voting. So all that was done, you can always bring your own hand sanitizer as well, but really wearing the mask, and I would even advocate if you wanna bring your um, eye protection, your goggles, or your face shield along with the mask, but the mask is the necessity, not just having the face shield. Yeah, I would almost say goggles are more important than worrying about the services right now. Yeah. I wore my goggles when I was in line too. Yeah. 
Did you, you've already voted? I have. And we uh, did that by mail. All so right. Ours was easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Controlled all the house. services and all yeah. the contacts just inside our that's house. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's that's great. So I, I think, you know, Taylor, I think it's safe. And mm -hmm. I would go so far as to say it's, 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 it's safe and has great social, you know, obviously importance. Yeah. But I think the key is the breath cloud and, and the, six, the, the separation, wearing mask and eye shield or eye protection. Um, I don't think surfaces in general yeah. are as much of a concern right. now, Hawk, as they were initially. We stress that a lot. But as we've gone mm -hmm. through this pandemic, I think we've seen that's less of a concern. It's really all about the breath cloud. Yeah, and we know it, it is the high touch surfaces, um, but it is much less of spreading the disease, the surfaces, than is the close contact. Yeah, so I think, Taylor, other questions or follow up to that? No, none for me, thank you. Good. Other questions? All right, we have uh, Cody wants to know from Channel 9. He writes, the CDC recently came out with a new study suggesting patients hospitalized with COVID-19 are five times as likely to die compared to patients hospitalized with the flu. What's your reaction to this study, especially as people use flu as a comparison to downplay the virus? And also, what are your pandemic-related concerns going into flu season? Oh, you bet. So. Hawk, that's exactly the number we've been talking about all the time. Is yeah. we our, our, our mortality rate from the people who come in and die with COVID runs 8 to 10%. Mm -hmm. That is about five times higher than the flu yeah. death rate. And so we would have said exactly that. And I think we've actually been saying that on the program. So I don't think that surprises us. Um, and, and it's what we've been saying all along. This is a far deadlier disease. It's far more transmissible than the flu, and it's far more deadly, and it doesn't have the therapeutic choices like flu does. So on every aspect, it's just worse. Um, now, in terms of what's coming on that's going to hurt us, I, I, I think it's clearly, A, there's a lot of cows out there. And I don't mean cattle. I mean COVID weariness syndrome. People are tired of it. They want to be done with it, and they're tired of wearing a mask. And I get it. You know, wearing a mask, yeah, my face feels all funny, it's, and then it gets a little wet, and you try to exercise in it. Yeah, it's a pain. I'd say it's a pain in the rear, but it's really not. It's a pain in your face, so <laughs> that doesn't work. But I think that what we need to point out is that that's what does keep us safe. We know in places where mask wearing as a culture is strong that those communities have far less spread. And I don't think we spend enough time having that conversation. Um, we, sp we spend a lot of time tra talking about the politicization of masks, but we don't step back and say, gosh, how are people people doing in communities where they wear a lot of masks and where social distancing is strong and the answer is those communities are doing much better if it was only social distancing we wouldn't see this rise out in the in the rural areas because there's more distance etc it's really all about that combination wearing the mask having the distance mm -hmm. and then staying home if you're sick and washing your hands if you do those things you can stay safe what I think we're both concerned about, Hawk, is that as things get colder and people go inside, they take parties inside, they're not outside anymore, yeah. well, that, bring, that, that narrows the distancing and changes the ventilation story. Or if you go to restaurants, which we know are a hot spot, mm -hmm. if you go to restaurants and you're going inside and people have not de-densified that restaurant, that that's going to increase the spread of COVID. Yeah, I, 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 you can't, I can't say any better. You're exactly right. It's um, indoors, lack of good ventilation. Meeting together, it's going to be cold. I know people are moving into their garage to have people over rather than their, their driveways. Uh, I suppose if the garage door is open, uh, that's okay. But if it's a closed garage, you're still, that's even less ventilation. So, yeah. so there are things to be concerned about that, but I agree with you 100%. Moving forward, it will certainly be uh, very dangerous for that individual, I believe, if you get a co-infection with influenza and COVID-19. Uh, number one, because we know what COVID does. And if you get critically ill and you're in the hospital, we understand that your lungs fill up with um, immune cells and, and collateral damage and all of that fluid. Um, if you have influenza on top of that or, uh, and or you get a secondary bacterial infection, a bacterial pneumonia such as staph or strep, it's going to be difficult, I think, to treat that, get the antibodies to where, uh, get the antibiotics to where they need to go to treat that bacterial infection because we also know, unfortunately, you have a lot of blood clotting, small blood clots, large blood clots in your lung, and all that helps decrease your gas exchange and decrease, um, you know, obviously uh, vital things to your lungs, such as the drugs, such as the antibiotics as well. 
you know, I think the final thing is this is just going to be the time of the year when people are going to get sick with other stuff. Yeah. And whether it's just a regular rhino virus mm -hmm. or whatever other common cold viruses are out there, other common coronavirus, then I think our fear is also that either A, people will just become immune to this and they'll stop respecting it because they're going to get other colds. B, that um, we will see concurrent infection of like influenza and coronavirus together, which we suspect is going to be a bad combination. Or C, people just get, as I said earlier, they're just going to have too much cows, they're just going to quit trying. I think the good news is that if you follow the principles of infection control, A and B won't be true because you'll negate that effect because you're taking good uh, infection control precautions. And I think we're really hoping it's going to be like the Southern Hemisphere where they saw an extremely low amount of influenza activity yeah. compared to the last five years. But a lot of that's based upon good yeah. infection control pillars. Right. Leah has a question. She says, essentially, the heart of her question is, at what point does SARS-CoV-2 turn into the disease COVID-19, and how is that determined? What's the diagnosis? She's wondering if, in, when we're writing as reporters, mm -hmm. um, are we misspeaking when we say, I tested positive for COVID? Did I test positive for that, or did I Good test question. positive that for the virus? That's a great question. question. Appreciate the, yeah. uh, the, the chance to actually clear that up a little bit. Uh, you know, the truth is that when you test positive, you're testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. For the virus, yeah. And then you have COVID-19 when mm -hmm. you have symptoms. As, exactly. And that range of symptoms is um, from very mild to maybe some GI or loss of smell to the very severe that we see in the critical hospital. So that the COVID-19 is the spectrum of disease. The SARS-CoV-2 is the actual virus itself. And a lot of times they are used synonymously, but it's very good to delineate those two Yeah, because in fact, you can test positive for SARS-CoV-2. That's actually what the PCR nasal swab does. You Correct. may not have COVID-19. You could be asymptomatic, in which case, by definition, you don't have it. Right. Once you have symptoms, then you have COVID-19. Yeah. So if you had a, just had a random screening and you were positive, all we would say is, okay, well, you're positive for the virus. Don't know if you're going to get sick from it or not. Yeah. And I am at a reporter question. Excellent. All right. Well, let's turn. Becky, let's talk with you, and then we want to turn to Dr. Um, Subapathy today about uh, the things that are going on out there for mental health with providers and frontline health workers. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be with you all this morning. So I think it is and remains such a privilege to be a physician and a healthcare worker. It has always come with a unique number of stressors um, that are very real stressors. The pandemic has certainly escalated those stressors different than we have seen in the past and we know that now more than ever looking at and thinking about the well-being of those who are taking care of others is really important. So. It may be helpful to have a little bit of historical context Please. around um, this topic. Really, not just in the United States, but around the globe, there has been a discussion for the last decade, really, around well being for uh, physicians and healthcare workers. Probably some of our literature around physicians is the best or the clearest, but some of that came to be because uh, physicians were and are leaving or stepping away from medicine at really high rates. Um, physicians, unfortunately, uh, have risks of dying by suicide at much higher rates than the rest of the population. And when we ask physicians, we know that they report pretty high rates of distress. And that matters not just because uh, it has negative impact or sequela for the physicians and their families, but because it has potential for negative impacts on our patients. We know our patients get the best, highest quality, safest care, and they feel the best about that care when they're being cared for by uh, healthcare providers who are healthy, whose well-being is in a good place. And so knowing that as a system, a couple of years ago, we really started looking at understanding how best we can support our healthcare workers, um, not only looking at things in the profession and the system that are important drivers, but also uh, creating space for individuals to do their own self-care, to take care of themselves. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's so true. And I know that we read and hear about that and feel that you've been ahead here at KU. You've been helping us head up our physician wellness response, provider wellness response around the pandemic and in general. What lessons have we learned so far? Great question. I think we have learned a number of things. Um, maybe first and foremost that one size does not fit all as it relates to well-being. We 
as physicians and healthcare workers, we are humans, right? And so what is the right fit for support for each individual may look a little bit different. We know that basic care, almost like the pillars of prevention for the uh, pandemic, I think that the pillars for well-being are often some of the basic things. Um, basic care and support mm -hmm. providing space for time to eat and time to take a minute to step yeah. away from patient care, ensuring that uh, physicians and healthcare providers can get adequate sleep um, and be able to do the things they need to do to take care of themselves and their mm -hmm. families. We yeah. also know that the system drivers are important to look at too and understand how we work together as partners with our leadership in our health system and in our profession to ensure we're uh, setting the right boundaries. Dr. Sabapathy, and I hope I just said your last name correctly. I apologize if I did not. In your role as a PhD psychologist with Advent Health, talk to us a little bit about what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis um, with providers, frontline healthcare workers, and and what, what's your sense of sort of the state of the union for, for people who are in those positions? Yeah, what a great question. What a great way to say that. Uh, and this is Dr. Sabapathy. So the, the state of the union is uh, such a, a nice way to say this. And I'm so thankful that we're bringing this topic to um, everyone's attention. So thank you for this. You know, I, I'll start off by saying that, as you all know, physicians, providers are incredibly strong, incredibly resilient, and so, so capable of handling so many things on so many levels, it's, it's remarkable to me and those of us I think also who do physician and provider well-being, just how, how strong and resilient physicians are. But there is a sense of continued need to do, I often will say, so much for so many for so long. And physicians are asked to do so much for so many for so long. And um, so when we were back in March and April and we saw that happen, it was more of an acute stage of this pandemic, and maybe there was a hope or a belief or a wish, maybe is a better way to say it, that this would uh, last for uh, you know three, four months, um, if that, and then you know kind of dissipate. And as we continue to be in this, the state of of providers' mental status and well-being, there is a fatigue, there's a, a level of fear, and there's a level of frustration, right? And so ultimately. If we think about this, we have to really take into consideration the human equation, the human factor of these amazing, wonderful people that are essentially at the front line and the heroes of this pandemic, but they're tired and, and, and worn down. And I'm so thankful that they're, we're talking about this because it is something that I think the public needs to understand and know and that if the public does their part with the CDC guidelines, all the things that you guys mention all the time, it really does help aid the cause and aid, aid the problem at hand. So we still have very strong providers and physicians, and they're able to do their jobs remarkably well. But we as a system, what we try to do is make sure we support them and check in on them, and we call it intentional rounding. And it's gotten uh, some credibility in our system. If I walk into an emergency department, uh, mask up or gown up, uh, shield up and walk into the ICU or the COVID side, and I come in there to be in the trenches with, with folks, we try to be there with people and we try to walk the walk with them and let them know they're not alone and try to normalize uh, the need for having some of that support. It's not professional help for physicians and providers, it's support. I think that that's exactly right, and I, I that you clearly are someone of those folks who walk the walk and talk the talk, because talk the talk and walk the walk. I had that reversed, but <laughs> I think, but I do think that's so important. You know, it's uh, it's kind of like that tagline, right? I and mean, if you think about the struggle we have with COVID nineteen or SARS CoV two, it's kind of like that old tagline: "It's everywhere you want to be." And uh, I think that's kind of SARS, SARS. And so every place you want to be, that's where it is. And that means you have to find a whole, whole new way of running your life and doing things. And uh, even in the hospital, it just changes everything. And so it's it's a difficult trial for frontline healthcare workers, for providers, for mm -hmm. physicians, for everyone who's involved in the care of, of, of sick folks. So yeah, it's everywhere you want to be. That's why we all have cows. Chill. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, we are starting to get some, some questions in this morning. Linda wants to know, is it safe for me to have a ruptured breast implant replaced, and she says it's in caps, 
in Hayes, Kansas in November. I can and will wait if it's going to save me from getting COVID. I'm a high-risk patient. The reason I'm sharing her question mm -hmm. is because I think it's a broader question mm -hmm. in there about yeah, to come into seeking right health care mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. during a pandemic. Becky, we know that mm -hmm. patients who weren't seeking health care are not doing as well. We've seen increased deaths from breast cancer and heart attacks and other things. I think it's pretty safe to come to the hospital. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think putting on my primary care general medicine hat, I would say that we um, certainly had significant concern about our patients who weren't seeking the care that they needed because of concerns about safety. We have been incredibly intentional here about ensuring that it is safe to come in and receive care and um, to avoid care delays that can be really critical mm -hmm. to the health of individuals. So just to say, we track this, Dana, really, really closely. Yeah. What percent of time have we seen a patient get COVID-19 in our facility? How many patients has that happened to? And I know we track it here, we track it at Hayes, mm -hmm. we track it in Great Bend. What do you think? I'm going to say zero. I think it's darn right. It is zero. Uh, we do, uh, you know, we have a number of people on these contact tracing. Whenever any issue comes up about SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 in the hospital, whether it's a patient that has come in or it is a healthcare worker that has, you know, most likely, and we even track healthcare worker to healthcare worker. Um, so we have a lot of teams. We have a lot of resources behind tracking that and tracing all of that stuff. Dr. Sabapathy. At Advent Health, I'm going to guess there's a lot of work being done as well in that regard. But as a follow-up to that, what can you say to folks to help with the anxiety and the discomfort of, folks, of people who, who need to go get health care but don't? Yeah, great question. I, I really think with this population, it's important to be a bit sensitive to, to something that we like to call silent pride. Silent pride is a, a sense of, I can handle this, I can do this. And so what I try to do, and I think what's been helpful is, um, you know, we never question someone's ability to be able to handle the work, but we do highlight, as was said earlier, what are we doing for, for our own self-care? If we're having to uh, work harder and grind a bit longer and in doing it in uncharted territory, none of us like uncertainty because uncertainty uh, can produce more anxiety. And so what we really try to promote and focus on is first listen, uh, respect. There's a concept that we have here called that we call our, we do team well-being calls for our hospital. We call them well care calls. And care stands for compassion, acceptance, respect, and empathy. And we really try to approach uh, things, all things we do um, in that way, but particularly during this time with uh, the anxiety associated with taking care of patients and potentially what do I bring home to my families and my loved ones, we really encourage people to focus on let's control the controllables. I've had a privilege of working with professional athletes in the past, and I think professional athletes and physicians are very similar from an, a mentality perspective, right? I can do it. I can make the play coach. I can, I can take care of this patient. So we, we take some moments and we, we let those providers continue to take care of those patients. If, if they um, and their teams uh, feel they're in a good place to do so in managing the stress and the anxiety of the situation, but we also try to help them problem solve that stress and anxiety. What can we do to help? What can we make your situation better? What can we do to make you feel more safe? What can we do to make that case go smoother? We really try to listen and, and problem solve and we really do promote the self-care piece. The self-care piece is so important. Um, we're not the greatest at taking care of ourselves, right? So we're really trying to promote more self-care at this point in time. And another piece, as I turn it back over to you, is are we staying in the present? Are we staying in the present of what we have to do? So if we're gonna control the controllables and we stay in the present, that's gonna help us deal with the moment at hand it will help us refocus. We can be more intentional in what we need to do. We can get it done efficiently. We can get it done collaboratively. No one here has to do it alone. We can be together and it's collaborative. If we start thinking too much about five minutes from now or five months from now, we start developing more anxiety. And if we start thinking too much about the past, the woulda, coulda, shouldas, we're more prone to frustration, depression, or even irritability. So we try to stay in the moment.
Yeah, I totally think that makes great mm -hmm. sense. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I learned on that on some family counseling once. <laughs> we did, and, and, uh, and they kind of said, put it out there as if it's going by you on a trade. And I was like, oh, that's pretty good. If I just think about it, it's going by me, and I have to look at it and think, I'll go, well, what's going on right there? Uh, that, that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and also, the, the also answer that uh, listener who asked that great question. Uh, it is safe to go to the hospital. Yeah. I know Advent Shining Mission. I know Larry Botts is the CMO over there. I think St. Louis. I think all, all these uh, North Kansas City Liberty, these folks who participate in our CMO calls on a really regular basis, uh, people are doing a great job at keeping patients safe. I just think you will be safe getting your uh, work done uh, at Hayes. You would be safe at KU. You'd be safe at Shawnee Mission Advent. You'd be safe at the, the hospitals here in Kansas City. I really believe that. And I would not hesitate to come get care. In fact, I would say that when it comes to infectious disease, hospitals are safer now than they have ever been because this great work on infection control around COVID, it makes a difference across a, across all the spectrums. And so I think you're actually safer in the hospital today than you were prior to the pandemic. Yeah. Okay. Well said. Eliza wants to know, what are the chances of false positive slash negatives? We visit our son who, after we left, he tested positive. My husband had symptoms, tested negative. And me and my other son, no symptoms. Mm -hmm. We tested negative. When should one be tested? Okay, Hawk. That's great. It's all about the test. What kind of yeah. test are you doing? The unanswerable question here. And I just, that's exactly right. I just had conversations with Dr. Leesman yesterday about this um, because there's a lot of, uh, there was some text, uh, not text threads, but email threads on servers going about the antigen test. So I think it really depends what test that was. Um, we understand that the antigen test will probably have more false positives depending on the prevalence, the amount of disease in that area. Um, if it is a PCR test, the likelihood, again, no test is 100%, but the likelihood that that's a false positive is not very high. So I think that's where we have to start is what type of test was it? Just for influenza tests, um, there are antigen tests, which are just pieces of the virus, and there are the PCR tests which look for the, uh, the genomic material. We know that in areas where there's not a lot of influenza activity at that time, you are actually more at risk of getting a false positive antigen test. The same thing can be said for the SARS-CoV-2 uh, tests, even, uh, even with that antigen test. But if it's a PCR test, it's probably less likely that it's a false positive, and it's more likely that it's a true positive. All right, Vincent has a kind of interesting but off-topic question. He wants to play indoor tennis. He contacted the U.S. Tennis Association who said, we're following the CDC guidelines, but they also said to ask you guys, is it safe to play indoor tennis? In a tennis bubble, I'm going to assume is the question. So, yeah. you know, that's a great question, and um, I think it all depends on density. Yeah. So if there's a tennis bubble and mm -hmm. there's two people in the bubble, I think you're safe. Yeah. Because bubbles are Probably. large and it's going to disperse mm -hmm. stuff, you're way apart. If you're in a tennis bubble and let's say you're doing a fitness class and there's 12 people inside that bubble, tennis bubbles don't have a high turnover rate. They turn over the air about once or twice an hour. And the reason is that the way a tennis bubble is built is it stays up through negative pressure. And so it, it's not going to be changing the air a lot. It actually wants to not change the air a lot. And so, and, and secondly, that the, the, the vents around a tennis bubble tend to not go up. They tend to go down and out on the side. So all of that means that the air is relatively stagnant compared to most other rooms. And so as a result, I think you have to be a little careful inside a bubble, but I think it's all about the numbers mm -hmm. game. And without knowing if your bubble is covering one quart or two quart or yeah. three quarts, it's hard to say exactly what the number is going to be. But I think you start putting, you know, if you get a doubles team in there, you're probably okay on, well, let's say, a single court on a double. But I think you start getting too many people inside mm -hmm. that bubble, and then you have to worry about it. So I think it's more about fitness classes, you know, cardio tennis, things like that inside a bubble. I'd be a little more nervous about that, Hawk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's probably safer than a, um, bar or restaurant. you know, an arena, a bar, a restaurant, an arena, I mean, just somewhere else in that health uh, center that has four walls because it is it is pretty high yeah. pretty high ceiling, but it's not as good as outdoor so i think the important thing is just what you said uh the density the number of people in that it's probably a one two or three court bubble i would assume uh, but as you get more people in there more people on the courts it's going to be just increase your risk just a little bit more 
um, just because it is an enclosed space and like you said, low amounts of turnover. Dr. Larry, you talk to a lot of patients every day. Mm -hmm. What are you telling them to do as far as exercise? As the winter comes upon us and people are going to say, I gotta go inside, what, what are you saying? Yeah, absolutely. We're focusing as much as we can on outdoor options. So mm -hmm. layering up, getting outdoors as much as people can do that, avoiding crowded spaces, looking for ways that you can be creative if um, people are fortunate enough to have some gym equipment at home or opportunities even in their yard to exercise Exercise, we're encouraging that. Just avoiding, as you both have said very well, um, those crowded, uh, high-density locations. Yeah, I think that that makes all the difference. And layering up does make a difference. <laughs> does. I've got to talk. I'm trying to talk my wife into this right now because you know you can go skiing or fly fishing. I've been skiing and fly fishing when it's like 10 or 15 degrees. I'm okay. I'm pretty warm. Absolutely. But it's all about keeping your core warm. Absolutely. Yep. Cover your head. Wear your gloves. Yeah, you know, okay, this is a funny story. For a few years, a few years ago, now it's been a few years, my daughter's always cold. my oldest one. I was like, you know why you're always cold? She goes, well, I'm not cold. you got to put on layers. I have layers on. Well, you know, she was pretty, she's pretty cute, and she had an open collar, and she may have two, three, but her, there's no way her core could be warm. So I went out, and I bought her stuff to keep warm. She goes, Dad, I can't wear this. Well, you're going to be warm. <laughs> well, then she moved to Chicago. I don't know if you listened this morning. She moved to Chicago yeah. when the wind blows a lot in the winter, and she started layering up. She goes, Dad, I'm so impressed at how, cold, how, how much warmer I feel. Uh, yep, it's really hard to admit your parents are right. <laughs> <laughs> again and again, right, kid? That's what I'm thinking. Okay. <laughs> Well, kind of speaking about parenting, I don't know how much you want to share, but uh, Cindy would like to know a little bit with both of our guest doctors on how you are balancing work life. <laughs> Do you have kids and what are you doing? All right, back. Such a great question, Cindy. Thank you for asking. Um, I think some days we balance better at our house than others, but um, Dr. Sabapathy actually knows my husband, so we are a two physician family. He works at, um, as a general surgeon. We do have two uh, young boys, and we have been navigating the interesting school platforms and the ever-changing environment around what education looks like this year. Um, and I think, you know, really it is kind of about identifying what things are important to your own well-being and ensuring that you're doing those things. So for our house, that's, you know, being sure we exercise every day, trying to eat healthy as best we can, and then really being able to carve out even just small pieces of time as a family to, you know, go on a hike, take the dogs for a walk. Uh, they don't have to be, um, big things to be meaningful things. I think Dr. Sabapathy said so well about being in the moment. I heard someone say once that I really liked be where your feet are. And I think that that is really speaks to the not um, worrying about the past and maybe not getting too far in front of yourself in the future in terms of worrying, but just being where your feet are at. Dr. Sabapathy, do you have kids? I do, I do. My girls are 17 and 14 and oh. uh, that's fine. I know, That's right? So, uh, I mean, so as a senior and a freshman, it's uh, what a unique year. It's the first year that they get to be back in the same school together. The last time that was happening was in elementary school, right? So mm -hmm. unfortunate that they get to be back in the same school together for one last hurrah during a, a pandemic. But I so appreciate the question because I think that um, – I'm always just so humbled when I get that question about my own work-life balance because I think um, I, I think I've learned from people that do this well-being work for a while is just because I talk about it doesn't mean I know exactly how to do it all. You know, I, it's a work in progress for me too. Um, so I, I think what we try to do is very much what was stated is we, we try to do the things that we enjoy, try to do things that we like. I think as the weather shifts, we're going to be challenged a little bit. I played tennis the last two nights, and we were at an indoor club that has several, several courts that is incredibly ventilated, but we it's all a numbers game. So I'm trying to still stay fit and still stay mindful of things. There's an exercise class that I would typically do at 5 a.m., but they're kind of shut down. They're virtual, so I try to do that in the morning. And uh, But I, um, I think for me, and probably so many uh, physicians as well, um, and providers, we think so much about our families, and um, you know. So I know initially one of the hardest parts was not giving hugs, hugs and handshakes, and missing out on those. But at home, not giving my girls hugs, right when we come back, and especially days that I was in the hospital or grinding right next to providers, and so I think those were some of the unique things that I think we want to highlight. That takes a toll 
on people over time, takes a toll on providers and physicians, and it's that a bit of that erosion of the soul that kind of happens. So that's why we want to keep watching out for everybody right now. Yeah, I love that, the erosion of the soul. Actually, I don't love that, but I no. love the expression. So what do you know, Hawk? You've got some young kids. I do. I do have one meanager. He'll be 14. <laughs> no, he's actually pretty good. He's, he's pretty good. Uh, and then my, uh, I have a daughter who is, will soon be a teenager. But, um, you know, I like to try and get out, uh, especially walking and running, um, and we'll be doing it more. Um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult because the sun's going down earlier, but it's always nice to get out and walk take them on walks, um, try to get to the gym when I can. Just yeah, I think it's all about the balance. And I think yep. the other thing is that you have to make a decision about your bubble. What's the level of risk you're willing to accept? So I'm going to tell you my story. So my kids are all grown up, and it's amazing when they're 30, 27, and 24 that they don't do what you tell them anymore. Not that they really did since they were teenagers or meanagers. But I think that um, you have to decide what your level of risk is. Are you willing to tolerate really high risk, in which case you don't wear a mask, you go to bars and you do things, and you're really going to you're, you're going to get it right at some point in the next day, in the six months, in the next six months, the high you have a very low, high likelihood to get that disease. The scarier part to me is you have a high likelihood of transmitting yeah. the disease to other people mm -hmm. who may be vulnerable, and, and that's why I think the high risk is a bad idea. It's not just about you; it's about all the people you can hurt. Mm -hmm. Then becomes medium low and what I would say very low risk. Mm -hmm. And I probably am in the low category. And that's the amount of risk I'm willing to take on. And by definition then, my wife and I have a pretty restrained bubble, but it's not a ex completely exclusive bubble. I still give hugs. I'm not shaking as many hands. Um, and I'm, but I'm really good about mask wearing. We don't go out, we don't party unless we're outside. And, and even then, it's if there's a lot of people around, it's crowded, we're out of there. It's all about wearing a mask, trying to maintain some degree of distance. Still go to work out at my club, but it's outside. And so that allowed, in, in this workout facility, it, it's not indoors, it's outdoors. I think I'm pretty darn safe out there. So those are questions about levels of, of risk you're willing to take on. If you're really going to say, I'm a patient has active cancer and I'm on chemotherapy, you need to be in that, I can't take on any additional risk bubble, in which case you've got to be sheltered at home, you've got to exercise at home, you can take walks outside, you can do things, but you really don't want to be around anybody. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this conversation is about what is the level of risk you're willing to take on, and that is both a physical question and I think it's a big mental health question. And you have to decide about that in your own right. The one thing I would encourage you to do is remember that when you decide to take on a lot of risk, you really can injure other people. And I think that, that's my, been my struggle in the whole thing about I don't want to wear a mask. You know, this is about freedom with responsibility. And if you make the decision that you aren't going to wear a mask, you don't only run risk to yourself, you run risk to all the people you're around. So if you're okay with injuring others, then you can take that choice. I think that's just a really bad choice. Joe wants to know what you think of the UK study where they are intentionally mm -hmm. infecting mm -hmm. participants with SARS. Yeah, yeah that's a great one. Hawk, let's you and I take that on a yeah. little bit and then we'll turn to our mental health <laughs> providers and say what they think about that from, a, from that standpoint. But we better explain it a little bit because this actually isn't a new concept. No. When you are doing a viral vaccine study to determine if it works, you got to intentionally try to infect people to see if the vaccine's working. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we know that other challenge studies have occurred. We, we thought, you know, early on, Challenge studies for this would, you know, not be not unethical, but it'd be very difficult because we don't understand exactly what can happen to the individual. You could have mild to no symptoms, or even as a healthy person, you can progress to that critical illness and death. So, you know, challenge studies are not new. They have done challenge studies with the rhesus macaque model. Um, they've done challenge studies with mice models. They are looking, I believe, also at the number of infectious particles it takes to create infection. Certainly, um, I believe from mouse models, we do have an infectious particles of about uh, a, a, log, a two logs. So that'd be about, um, you know, 100 to 200 uh, or so. Um, viral particles. I think it's okay as long, and I, I'm pretty sure uh, that the uh, participants are going to have full informed consent. They are going to be told everything about. But I feel that as most volunteers, as with the vaccines, they are feeling this is their duty to help uh, to help with the world, really, and society. And so this is their contribution to that. So. Yeah, I think the key is what you just said about informed consent. So if you look at some of the studies that are done on African Americans or with prisoners and other yeah. groups of people, they didn't know that they were being uh, studied. And is it that? That's just morally wrong. 
But if you say to somebody, we're going to subject you to this, and here's the risks that we understand them, and we can make you sick, but we're also going to take care of you if you get sick, then that's a question of we're just trying to help a greater society, and that's informed consent that people can turn down. There can be no leverage around that. There can be no attempt at coercion around that. Um, I think it has to be something that people are willing to do because they want to participate in that study to, to, to contribute to a greater good. But it has to be informed consent. Otherwise, I think it's immoral. I think that, and, and that's how the vaccine studies, by the way, are done. They're done with informed consent, as you yes. pointed out. And I think that's just, that, that's, from, that's, you just can't emphasize how important that is. But the other thing you're left with is just the epidemiological side of this otherwise to say, did a crowd of people who got the vaccine end up with getting less mm -hmm. infection than those who didn't get the vaccine or did get or did not get the vaccine? And that can be harder to establish. And so the other problem is you don't know the length of time you're protected. There was a study published in Nature in the last 24 hours. They're saying, man, we're a little nervous about some of the vaccine data mm -hmm. because it looks like your your protection may be gone in two to three months. Yeah. Now. The number of people who are still being infected is a lot lower, so there, there's just a lot to be discovered about that, and I think that's why those challenge studies are important. Now, having said all that, mental health side of challenge studies, what do you think? You know, I think so much of this just comes back to calculated risk, knowing your own comfort level with individual um, responsibilities and risk taking, but so much of this, nothing like a global pandemic to teach us how much shared responsibility we have for one another, right? That uh, so much of taking care of our mental well-being is intertwined with taking care of our physical well-being. And whether that's the well-being of each other and our families or our healthcare providers, it's wearing your masks, it's making thoughtful choices, it's washing your hands. All of those things really were not um, existing in an individual space where all have a shared responsibility to take care of one another. All right. Jill, last question. Diana wants to know if you have your glasses with you because she wants to for you to, to model them and show her she wants to cover. What do, what do they need to look like and oh, what do they sure need to cover? I do, because I always do. Where are they? Where did I put them? <laughs> okay, okay, you get to it first. Yeah, mine are in the office. Ha! Dun, 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 Okay, there I go. If I don't pull the thing out of my ear, yep, this is what it looks like. And notice, side, side shield, shields. front, underneath, side shield, you know, think about like a ski goggle or those aviator goggles or something like this. And by the way, Amazon.com, you can get them at the hardware store. You can get them a lot of places. It's not some big safety thing. You don't have to spend $500 on these. You can go spend about 5 or $10 on them and be, be just fine. You get a number of pairs for that price, actually. So. And, and while eyeglasses may offer some protection because they directly right in front of the, the eyeball block, you can obviously see that there it is a little bit wider and larger than, than the surface area that's covered by the eyeglasses. And well. they make you look really good, as you can yeah, see. Yeah, he looks <laughs> Dr. Samapathy, final thoughts for today. Yeah, well, thank you so much again for highlighting this topic. And I, I think um, I just uh, I'm so honored to, to work uh, next to physicians and providers and to work with people like yourself on this call. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing at uh, KU Med on the community, for the community, and just to keeping people so so well uh, well informed. And one of the, the last pieces I would say, and it relates to that sense of calculated risk and shared responsibility, I think we'll, we are studying the pandemic now and we'll, for years to come we will be studying it. And it will really be in a very interesting, I think, sociological event that we end up studying. It'll be the biological, the chemical, the viral aspects, but we will also study not just the mental impacts, but we will study it from a sociological perspective, meaning what did people do to mitigate risk? What steps did we take in healthcare and what steps did the public take to mitigate risk? And as we're thinking about this, I think we should think about that right now, that this is a legacy that's forming and we have the opportunity, even though we're a little bit behind the game right now, to get ahead of it and do the right things. We can change history right now. So if we do some of those things that you all have mentioned and continue to mention, we have a chance to shift this. And maybe our story doesn't have to be as severe and chronic. So we all have that opportunity to do the right thing together. And I'm just so honored to be a part of this call and to work right alongside to, uh, you all as well. Well, beautifully said, and thank you. And we're honored to have you on the program. You can come back anytime. I uh, appreciate agree. that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I Dr. couldn't have said that better, Dr. Sabapathy. I think really the thing we say over and over here is look out for one another and take care of one another. And I think that's true whether you're just checking in, you know, 
Dr. Stites, Dr. Hawkinson, how are you doing today, or whether it's putting on your mask and washing your hands and um, being sure that you're making safe choices. Yeah, so Dr. Sabapathy and, and, and Dr. Lowry, thank you guys so much for being on yeah. this. This has been great. You've done a great job. You guys are both back anytime. Hawk. Yeah, you. I, you know, I think um, the challenge study was a good question. There's so much in the news right now with the CDC and recommending uh, face masks on public transit. These challenge studies, we know that um, there are other vaccine trials that are going on, still on pause. There's just so much in the news right now. We know that a uh, college had a uh, stay at home order with the University of Michigan, I believe. So um, it is currently uh, very rapidly changing, and I think it's going to continue to do that, especially as move, we move into those uh, colder months and people are going to be inside doing things, as we heard today from guests on the show and questions. But the main things that we can con continue to do is reduce the risk as much as possible, understand what your risk is, physically distance, don't meet in groups. Um, wear your mask and perform, you know, hand hygiene. Absolutely. Hey, tomorrow we got some good guests coming back on our program, so we want to talk a little bit about that and, and appreciate, uh, again, the great work that you guys are doing out there to help us with our mental health and, and also to, to spread that good word. Hey, tomorrow, Julian uh, Van Lu, I'm not sure if I said that right, the, the director of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County and KCK Public Health is back and joined by Mariana Ramirez Mantilla, the director of UNTO's Center for Advancing Latino Health Department of Population Health. They've got some news they want to share, and it's both good and some challenging news about the viral spread and the testing and the pillars of infection prevention and control. So really appreciate their coming on tomorrow. That'll be a great program. Hope that you are, all are able to join us. Remember, too, to send us your mask pictures. Hey, um, we've talked a lot about the need to support our frontline physicians, nurses, staff, and, and really all first responders, et cetera, who are soldiers in this pandemic. The ultimate help of course, is to not get sick and wear your mask so you don't sick it, make others ill. We've got the ask of two people who are recovering COVID-19 patients that you may know. You're going to hear from them in just a moment. I just want to say to all of our listeners, to everyone out there, remember those pillars of infection prevention and control, they do travel with you. And interestingly, as hard as sometimes they are, they're going to keep you physically healthy and mentally healthy. There's still no place like home. Let's take a listen to what these two women have to share about COVID-19. It's a lot easier to get than you think. I mean, taking all the precautions that I have over the last six, seven months, and then it's the one time that I kind of let my guard down a little and I get it. It's easy to play it off as out of sight, out of mind kind of a deal. And I know everybody feels like, well, you know, that's that's something that's happened to somebody I know, or I see it on the news, and it's probably not going to happen to me. But let me tell you, it, it could happen to you. I know it's been a long time, and we're all kind of over it, but I would definitely say that it's still just as bad as it was months ago. It needs to be treated as such. No one wants to see their loved ones in the situation that I was in. So if, if anything else, think about and be respectful of everyone that's around you. Wear those masks, wash those hands, and be vigilant in it.